Well, guys, uh, it is it's 9.30 on the dot, and uh, if you received a handout when you walked in, you'll see that we have 675,000 things to cover this morning on these uh, three and a half chapters of, of Revelation. Um, just by show of hands, who read their homework this week? <laughs> the pastor's wife. Um, <laughs> Now, what I would love for you guys to do is, as we're going through this each week, look at what, what's coming up ahead of you, um, because this is a lot. I mean, in, this, in this, this Revelation 4, 5, 6, 7, and the first couple of verses of 8, we're going to run into uh, some of the questions that were asked uh, in, in, when I asked you that first week to write down some stuff. And so like the 144,000, that's part of this week. Uh, but that is such a minuscule part of the grand picture of what we're going to be talking about today um, that, that those kind of things are great to be able to jump into. And, and the reason that the slides, the, the handouts are so vastly huge, uh, that you have eight pages of handouts, and if you were fortunate enough to grab one that mistakenly printed on legal size paper, it means you've got a lot of space you can take notes on. Um, there is still quite a bit of uh, space to take notes even if you don't have that. But, uh, but I, just, I wanted to start quickly this morning, especially because there's just so much to cover. Uh, but I can tell you, I got super excited reading this week. Um, you know, again, as we dive into this, remembering that the people whom, to whom this was written had a knowledge that we don't. They had, they, were un, they, they had an influence of the Jewish history that we just don't have. And that, that came no matter where they lived. Uh, the Jewish people had infiltrated. They had been at the cornerstone of the world for the last 2,000 years. And so their culture had transformed. And while the Greek culture is taking over, the Jewish culture was still there. And so, so when we jump into this, I just want you to understand that these people were, were inundated by Jewish culture. And so this morning, um, I just want to jump in um, and start in verse 4. And, and as I hit things, I'm going to stop and we'll talk about them uh, quickly. But we want to keep moving this morning because it's a lot. That doesn't mean don't ask questions. I want you to ask questions if you have them. So let's, uh, let's pray for divine wisdom and understanding and, uh, and just for the outpouring of God's spirit on our time together. Father, we are thankful that you have brought us here today. And we ask that in this time, above all, we stay focused on you. We stay focused on the gospel of your son, the, the story of him and the story of your love for us in sending him. And God, remembering that that is the cornerstone of the book of Revelation. May we base everything off of that. So give us your presence, give us your guidance, give us your understanding this morning as we open up this scripture. In Christ's holy name we pray, because of his redemptive blood. Amen. So, it starts off, after these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold the throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he who sat there was like jasper and sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders seated, clothed with white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Because I could spend the entire time on this. So in this, when you read this, oh, do you need one of those? Right behind you. Mr. Larry's got one. Um, so when you open this up and you read this and you begin to dive in, anytime you hit something that is incredibly specific, you got to ask a question. So, so like when I'm reading this and and it says in verse 3, and he who sat was like a jasper and a sardius stone. Well, 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 that's really, really specific. All right? 
So I stopped and I said, well, what are these stones? And where are they talked about in all of Scripture? And there are two places in the book of Revelation that they are spoken about. Number one is right here in chapter 4. The second place is in chapter 21 when it talks about the walls of the New Jerusalem. There is only one place in all of Scripture outside of Revelation that these stones are talked about, and they're talked about in Exodus. Why Exodus? In this conversation in Exodus chapter 28, God is revealing to to the Israelites, to Moses specifically, and he says, when the high priest enters the Holy of Holy, he needs a breastplate. What is a breastplate for? Protection of what? It's right here. It's the protection of their heart. Why would he need a breastplate? To protect his heart. Somebody's going to throw seven stones. Because he's in war. He is in spiritual warfare when he goes into the Holy of Holies. Now, there are 12 stones on this breastplate. The first stone is Jasper. The 12th stone of these 12 stones is Sardius. Each of the 12 stones represents one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Their names are written on it. They are sealed in stone as the people of God. And this is the protection for the high priest's heart. All of the stones that are on there, if you look at that, there's a picture of it there on your page. It is the rainbow. It is Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. They are all there. So when it talks about... The throne looks like, the throne looks like that thing that the high priest has to wear when he is ready to battle Satan. Sorry, my head's exploding. Y'all look totally lost. This, this is saying the person who sits on that throne, that is the high priest. And he is ready to do battle with Satan. And this is where the revelation begins. Up until this point, we've looked at kind of an introduction, talking about stars and and lampstands. And we've talked about these 12 churches and what they can mean. And all of a sudden, we get to the part where people lose their mind in trying to figure out what revelation has to say. And it starts out with saying, there was a throne And it is the high priest. Mr. Larry, are there any more of those handouts? Right there. Oh, they're on the back table too? Okay. Um, And so this is where we start out. And, And around it is a rainbow of colors. And so then we get into there are 24 thrones that surround this one throne. And so I'm going to ask you in your in your handout to flip over to um It's the next, to, it's, it's, it's this last page that says uh, the seal of Israel is at the top. In the box over to the side of this is the Hebrew numerology of the Bible. Okay, really quick before we go on. Please. Thing that in Exodus 28, this, when, when there's the instructions about those stones, that's, that was the breastplate that the high priest would wear? Yes, okay. yes. That is the high priest of the, ble- the, of the breastplate of the of the. High, Sorry, I am running a thousand and one miles a minute. There's a handout on the back pa- on the back table there, ladies. Um, <clears throat> sorry, we jumped in it on time because like we got a lot, lot to cover in this one. Um, <sighs> the Jewish high priest wore when he went into the holy of holies is covered with these twelve stones. And these 12 stones, there's, there's another couple of parts to it if you read all of that Exodus 28. Um, and, and there is a way that this breastplate helps the, the high priest to make decisions about the future of the Israelite people. And the 12 stones represented. The 12, 12 stones, each stone had the name of the tribe it represented on it, inscribed on it. Uh, in another word, it was sealed on it as we talk about the seven seals today. 
We're in the past. We're looking back at the book of Exodus. Yes. So, no, and that's one thing I want us to continue to remember as we look at the book of Revelation. These are people who understood the Hebrew culture. And so when, people, when things are said, it has a memory. Now, does that mean it's not written for the future? No. In fact, uh, every good historian will tell you those who do not know the history are doomed to repeat it. And, and if you look at every prophecy in all of the Old Testament, it starts with where we were, and if we don't change our path, what's going to happen to us? Most of the time, looking back at how God dealt with things then. And so that's kind of the same deal that we see. This is a modern-day prophecy. This is a New Testament prophecy. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to take us backwards before it can take us forward. So, all right. So, in understanding Jewish numerology, well, there's 24 thrones. So I want you to understand just a little bit about numerology. Anytime you see the number three in all of Scripture, it's going to represent divine. Three is the representation of Christ. You have the Trinity, right? Uh, when, when Jesus tells us who we ought to be taking care of, the widows, the or orphans, the sojourners, it's in threes. Uh, when you, whenever you see, uh, whenever you see stories, uh, Jesus talks about uh, the the uh, the Good Samaritan. How many people were there that had an opportunity to help the the injured man? Three. So these are conversations about the divine. Okay. So anytime you see the number three in all of Jewish scripture in all of the Bible, it's got a representation of God. Anytime you see the number four. It has a representation of earth. Uh, earth, wind, fire, water. Those are the four elements of the earth, right? So anytime you see four, you've got that. So why then does the number seven become important? It's the intersection of where four and three collide. So divine plus earthly gives you number seven where you begin to hit this holiness. Twelve, three times four, becomes the representation of all of God's people, those who call him Lord. It's the, now you've got the four times three, so it's the earthly that is now relying on the divine. Whereas in seven, you've got the divine that is intersecting with the world. Does that make sense? So, yes, sir, Mr. Leon. Yes. Yep. Anytime you see the number seven, it's going to be where the divine is interacting with the earth. And when you see 12, it's where the earth begins to interact with the divine. Now, when you get to 24, that is 12 two times. So this is an abundance of the people who love God. Ah, oh, there's so much here. And so does... It's going way too fast because none of this is written down anywhere. Oh, it's... Uh, 24 is not written down, but the Hebrew numerology. Yeah, Hebrew numerology is back here. Yes. Yeah, it is. The seven days of creation is, that's where the divine is interacting with the world. And he says in seven days, there will be wholeness. Right? So the seventh day for God was rest. And we honor God on the seventh day with rest ourselves. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I know. So, so the number 24 is not in this list. I, I had like 17 lists to choose from of Jewish numerology, and I had to really pare down to the ones that were hyper important. But when you get to 24, understand that is a, that is a conception of an overabundance of, of the divine and the world interacting. Okay, so when you talk about 24 thrones that are surrounding, is it necessary to say that is exactly a number 24? It is not necessary. It is, what, is, what it is calling is the people that surround God in this are the devoted leaders of his people. So the majestic of, of his leadership is surrounding him, which is an awesome, awesome thing, because that doesn't necessarily mean it is specifically 
the 12 sons, the 12 tribes, or is it specifically the 12 disciples? It is an abundance of the leadership, those who are, who are majestic in their walk of following Christ that are surrounding the throne. And they are the ones who are, are responsible for spreading the gospel in the world. <sighs> okay. So, have, have I beat that one up yet? You guys okay with the 24? Uh, well, that's the whole deal, is, is when, when we get to that number 12, the whole point of that is, is to say, the reason there are 12 disciples is because this is the response of the world to the divine. And so there were 12 that were written. Were there 12 disciples? Absolutely, we have names for them. But Jesus chose 12 on purpose. Because in the Jewish understanding, that says... God is wanting us to interact with him. And so we choose 12 disciples for that. I'm sorry, guys. I know I am bouncing off the wall and super hyper about this. And so please continue to ask questions because if not, I'm going to fly through. Okay? And I need to be slowed down sometimes. <laughs> uh, so, all right. So then, yeah, so, so you know, uh, he, uh, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices um, I know I've talked about this on Wednesday, and I don't know if I have talked about it on Sunday mornings before or not. When God spoke at Mount Sinai to give the law, okay, there's a very interesting phraseology, and this is the only other place we see this phraseology. When God spoke and gave the law to the people off of the side of Mount Sinai, Mo Moses is up high interacting with God, and all of a sudden God speaks out the Ten Commandments. When he speaks them out, the, uh, the phrasing in, in the Exodus is, and uh, thunderings and lightnings exuded from the, the mount. Now, we don't ever use those pluralistically, right? No one does. So when I was, uh, when I was preparing for a sermon on the Pentecost, the, the 50th day after, after Jesus' uh, resurrection, Easter Sunday, uh, I ended up in an Old Testament commentary by an old Jewish rabbi, actually written in 200 A.D., so there's this rabbi that's writing on that. And any time, and, and, and their perspective, not Jesus followers, not Pentecost understanding people, the understanding of the thunderings and the lightnings on the edge of Mount Sinai was this. When God spoke, he spoke the law in all 70 known languages in the world at one time. And when he did that, his, his tongue, his, his words descended like a, like a flame that rested on each per, next to each person's head and spoke the law to them in their own native language. And everyone in the world simultaneously heard God speak to them the Ten Commandments at one time in their own language. So there were lightnings, plural, because there's all these little lights all over the place. And there are thunderings because it is pure chaos of what comes out of God's mouth because it is everyone hearing it in their own language. Fast forward New Testament. The day of Pentecost. What was going on? Peter stands up, gives a sermon of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it says that everyone heard it in their own language. And they saw tongues of fire. This is huge in our understanding of who God is and how God wants to connect with us. Throughout Scripture, if you see the word fire, what does it represent? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit rested on each person and they heard the law in their own language. So now, here we are in Revelation, and this shows up again. So what language does God speak? All of them. Let's go a little bit further. What is the native language of Satan? Lies. 
So what is the native language of God? Truth. So when God speaks in this point, what that comes out is truth. So this is, this is all an elaborate way of saying, pay attention. God's about to do something outstanding. So, so we can take this and we can translate this into seeing so many different things. And, and, and really and truly what, what John is trying to say is, hey, hey guys, God's got some really important stuff for us. So the next thing we see in verse 6, before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal in the midst of the throne and all around the throne were four living creatures. Four, what does that represent? The world. All right. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like a calf. The third was like the face of a man, uh, had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And the four, the four living creatures, each had six wings, were, uh, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now, does anyone ever remember crossing a scripture in the Old Testament that talked about animals with six wings that were flying and saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty? Say it again out loud. Isaiah. Isaiah 6 to be specific. Look at the little box down to your right. Now, here's something that is so cool. Sorry, my mom's looking at me like, Trey, you're crazy. Because um, I'm jumping around and bouncing around. Isaiah 6 is the beginning of Isaiah's decree on the Jews. In the year of that, that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their face, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now, what are the Old Testament seraphim doing with, with their six wings? With two of them, they're covering their eyes. We are not permitted to see what is happening. With two wings, they're covered their feet. We need to protect because we are too vulnerable to hear what is, what is going on. Um, we'll just go there. Uh, there's, a, there's a deeper understanding. I don't think we want to go there yet. Uh, and then with two wings, they're flying. So they're hovering so they can see over. But their eyes are covered. Their feet are covered. Now, in the second telling of this, are their eyes covered? In fact... No longer are their eyes covered, but they are covered with eyes. Old Testament says, God is too holy to look at. Revelation says, I want you to see it all. I mean, this, this is huge. This is huge. When Revelation gets here, what, what John is saying through this imagery is, God will reveal everything about himself in this time. And so no longer do we have to be afraid to look at what God is doing or where God has been. We get to observe him each and every day now. And there comes a point in time where we will get to observe him each and every day there. So, So these, these four creatures, is it important that they are a lion, a calf, a man, and an eagle? Yes, there is some importance. Um, yes, it does. It does. Okay, so just, just real, real quick overviews. Um, lion, when, de when describing God... Use that term, the lion of Judah, all right? This is, this is, we're talking divine. We talk about calf. Calf is, is, a, um, is, a, is a sacrificial animal. 
Um, a calf is a follower. Uh, a calf is something that is used for great parties. Think New Testament, the prodigal son that killed the fattened calf. Man, man, the pinnacle of God's creation. Man, the one who was given a soul and the ability to follow Christ and the eagle. And I will mount up on wings like eagles. The eagle is the great overseer. So this is, this is the representation. Just throw it in there. Now, there's a ton of ways this can be seen. But primarily, just understand that, that we're still talking about the things God created. And they each have purpose. Okay? So, then... So then there's this scroll that jumps out, right? God is holding this scroll and he hands it down and he says, essentially, who is worthy to open the scroll? And it kind of, they kind of look around heaven. No one is able to open the scroll. And then out from in the midst of these four creatures, there appears one in the appearance of a slain lamb. Jesus. And he is the first and the only that has the power to open the scroll. Now, just to understand, um, you're on the page that has the lambs, the lamb takes the scroll on. If you flip over to the another, the, the, just the, the other side of that, the next page over, whatever, just flip it over directly, and you got the signet and seal. Just I wanted you to have an understanding. The signet makes a deep impression in clay, forming its official seal. The imprinted seal carries the full authority of the office it represents, and no one dare question it. His design is well known. So the, the, this is sealed by a king, a lord, a, a, a someone, and the seal is well known. Everyone's going to know what it is. Um, and... Um, his symbol, without any doubt, authentic. His mark indelibly declares the full authority of royal ownership. So this seal, this has been sealed with seven seals. God wants to impact the earth. Seven seals. And, there, and, and then it says, um, there is pain of death to those who violate it. So the only person that can open it is the person it was intended to read it. All right? So, and if someone opens it and it wasn't their job, <coughs> off with their head. So, we're standing in the throne room where the king is, and he hands over a seal. Why is everybody looking around? I'm not opening that. <laughs> and there's only one, and it's the one who has been slain so that everyone else has the right to be in the room. And he opens it. Now, what I want you to understand is there's a, lot of, there's a lot of speculation about these seals and what they are and what they could mean. There are only three other places outside of the book of Revelation in which seal, the, the, Hebrew, the, the, the Greek word for seal, is used. And I want you to look at those. They're on the same deal in the little box, the huge page-long box next to the Lamb Takes the Scroll. In Romans 4 is a conversation about circumcision. And circumcision was God's seal on Abraham. This was an outside look at what was going on inside. But he was sealed not by his circumcision, but by his faith. So in Romans, a seal is not about keeping a book closed. It is about proving that it is God's. All right? 1 Corinthians 3, Paul's right as an apostle, as an apostle. I am not free. I am not an apostle. Am I, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the results of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be a, an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship is the Lord. So what's the seal? It's still back to Jesus, right? It's still back to the seal that this is holding us together, right? Um, Second Timothy. 
Keep reminding God's people of these things. And it comes down to, nevertheless, God's solid foundation in verse 19 stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Sealed. So, so when we think about these seals on the scroll, these are the confirmation that we are his people. So when we look at this, when we begin to open these, there, some of them don't make any sense whatsoever. But each seal that is released is a seal that says we are his and he is ours. Okay, so we don't want to get lost in, in the, the jar, jumbled jargon, you know, messed up thing that is, but we want to open it up. And so then we have this who is worthy to hold the scrolls, worthy to open the scrolls, uh, now, when he had taken the scrolls, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lord, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seal. You were slain and have redeemed us to God your, with your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to God. And we shall reign the earth. Reign on the earth. All right. So when Jesus is worthy to open the scrolls, that's a point of celebration for the people that are around there. Because until Jesus was slain for all people's sin, no one was worthy to open the scroll. But now Jesus' blood has made him worthy to open it for us. Again, so much, guys. All right. So uh, let's, let's flip through these, these seals really, really quick. I'm trying to watch the time. We got 15 minutes. Um, so first seal, the conqueror. Second seal, conflict on earth. Sorry. Um, Fourth seal, third seal, sank, scar, scarcity on earth. Fourth seal, widespread dead, death on earth. Now, I'm going to stop right there for a minute. If you read through each one of these, you come up to what everyone has become known as the four horses of the apocalypse. All right? The first four seals have horses attributed to them. In the first seal, it is a white horse. And there, there is given... Um, a bow and a crown on the second seal. There is um, a red horse. Um, and this is, uh, he is given a sword. The third seal is a black horse. Let me find it. There's a black horse. Uh, and he is given scales. And, and you begin to see, now it starts talking about how much wheat and uh, barley start costing, but, but oil and, and wine aren't affected. Uh, and then on this fourth seal, you see a pale horse. Now, I point all of that out to say there is another scripture in which horses are talked about. And it's Old Testament. It's Zechariah. It's on the right-hand side of this. Now, this is very interesting uh, Zechariah is beginning his, his, uh, his prophecy uh, to the people of Israel. And he starts with this man standing under a myrtle tree. Uh, let's see, let me find it here. Sorry, I'm trying to read really fast. Uh, I'll just start at the beginning. On the, 12th, on the 24th day of the 11 month. 24? Important? A little bit. The month of Shabbat, the second year of Darius, the, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Zerubkiah, the son of Edu. I don't know. Uh, during the night I had a vision, and there, there was before me a man mounted on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in a ravine. Behind him were red, brown, and white horses. And I asked, why are these here? Uh, the Lord says, I will show you what they are. Uh, then a man stood among the myrtle trees, explained, the, they, they are the ones the Lord has sent 
to go throughout the earth. And they reported to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees, we have gone throughout the earth and found the whole world at rest and at peace. And they reported to the angel who was standing in the myrtle tree, we have gone throughout, the oh, I just read that, sorry. The angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah, which you have been angry uh, angry with these 70 years. 70 is also a very important thing. Uh, if you look at the numerology, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. flip over to the next page. Oh, I didn't take that one on there. Sorry. 70 is a, a time of completion, uh, a time of perfection through Christ. Um, sorry about that. Um, so the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. And the angel who was speaking to me said, proclaim the word. Um, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, I wanted to jump down. It, he described what each horse was. Am I missing it now? I may have cut this verse short. So he talks about each of these horses has a purpose. And they, are, they have gone throughout the world. They go north, south, east, and west, and they're looking around the world to see what's going on. And the world is at rest while the people of Jerusalem are in turmoil. So, so what we have here in this is all of a sudden we begin to see in these four horsemen, they are going out and they are beginning to turn the tides. The people of Jerusalem have been in great turmoil because the world is so sinful and they are at rest with their sinfulness. And now these horsemen are starting to go out and they're turning the tides. And so what you've got is, um, you've got the first one, which is, which is taking out the bow and the crown. Um, Four little creatures and a voice called like thunder and looked up and behold a white man with a bow and a crown. And he went out conquering and to conquer. So, so if he is going out to conquer and he's going out to a world which is blind to Christ, is he conquering them to kill them or may he be conquering them to transform them? You know? So the second one goes out the second one then goes out, and he, he's given a sword, and all of a sudden, the peace on earth is stopping. Now, if the world is at rest in their wickedness, is it necessarily that he is going out to start a war? Or maybe he's beginning to start an internal war with the people who have been blind to Christ. Perhaps... The war is internal, and people are starting to battle with themselves. Think about in your, in your first few days of Christianity. You know, most of us started following Christ because we knew we needed Christ. And then when we jump into following him, he begins to reveal to us, well, it's not just that you need to be saved for eternity, but there's things here that are wrong in our lives, and we need to battle with those things and to transform them. So, and then you, get, then you get to this third seal, and this was a little more difficult to understand, but this, there's actually a parable that almost parallels this. Uh, and it is a parable that we never read. We never read because it doesn't make any sense to us at all. Everyone knows the story of the lost son, the lost coin, and the lost sheep. Right after that story is a story that was told at the same time as those three. And it was referred to in your NIV as the, the, the parable of the shrewd manager. And it's a very weird one because this manager learns that he's been kind of lazy on his job and his boss is about ready to fire him. And so that he doesn't end up you know, homeless and destitute, he goes out to two of the biggest debtors to his boss before the word can get out that he's about to be fired and he makes deals all over town and he does this so that he can have a job when he loses this one because these these guys specifically the two that it, it talks about him going to and settling their debts they're going to remember and they're probably going to offer him a job but here's where the things get really weird and where the church never knows what to do with it the, the, the owner of the business who this manager just took major advantage of and probably sealed his fate as losing his job 
calls him intelligent and shrewd, and he lifts him up for it. He, he says, that was good. Wait, what? I just lost you money. How can that be good? How can you see me as good? Here's what that parable is there to tell us and what this is there to tell us. What is God's commodity? Is it money? He's got the, he's got the cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need our money. What is his greatest commodity? What did Jesus come to bring? Grace. God's commodity is grace. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, so God's commodity is grace. So in this, does it really matter what the cost of wine and oil and wheat and all that kind of stuff? Because Jesus is the bread of life. So we don't care what wheat costs. And it's funny because it's in this, it says the oil and the wine are not effective. The oil and the wine are things that are divine. The wine is the blood of Jesus Christ and the oil is the olive oil, the olive tree, that, that branch of grace and mercy and love. Now this is, this is cataclysmic to us. And so, and then the fourth seal, the fourth seal is the only horse that isn't referred to in the, in the, uh, the Zechariah, and it's a pale horse. So there is, what does pale mean? Pale is sick. Pale is, is this part where, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. And so I looked and behold, a pale horse, and the, the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. And the power, oh, the name was death, and Hades followed him. And the power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and the beast of the earth. Who does death not affect? Christians, everyone that's been covered by the blood, this is great news to the Christian church. There's a point in time where this suffering ends. This turmoil that we're in ends. And, and every Christian, while death is not our ultimate, that's not what we, like, ooh, I can't wait to die. We aren't scared of it. We aren't scared of it because what's on the other side of death is true life. And so, so this, is, this is, again, this is promises. Then, and, and which seal is this? This is the fourth seal. This is the earthly seal. This earth passes. It goes away. It's no big deal to us. So this pale horse is not for us anything to be concerned about. This world is just going to die. We all are going to have our time. So, and then in the fifth seal, the funny thing is the fifth seal doesn't actually have an action to it. It is the cry of the martyrs. So the fifth seal, um, the fifth seal, it's all these martyrs are going, hey, what about us? And he goes, oh, oh I'm sorry, here's your white cloth. cloth. Here, here you go, here's your robe. Sorry, I, I, I'm, there's a hope, there's a promise. This after earth part is, oh, I don't, have to, I don't have to worry about this anymore. And then, I love this, seal six, cosmic disturbances. Oh, gosh, I got three minutes. Cosmic disturbances. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. Mourning. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Mourning. That is what sackcloth is all about. The moon became like blood. The moon was weeping for us. And stars of heaven fell on the earth. Um, stars. Stars are representation of Abraham. Your descendants will be as numerous as stars. This is where we begin to see every king and kingdom is going to fall. Now, does it happen like, like, boom, everything's gone? This was written when the Roman emperor was the end all be all. Where is he today? Every emperor is dead and in a grave. One by one, they all fell. Every major person on earth, one by one, is going to fall. Now, in God's time, that fast. They all fell. He doesn't exist in time. It does, this does not have to be a linear event for him. 
One by one, they're all going to fall. One by one, all these celestial bodies, all these things that think they're so much bigger than the universe, they're going to give up. They're going to fall. And that is, that is the biggest thing that that's saying. Now we get to oh, the, the, the seal of the Israelites. And, and here's where we go back into that numerology again. Um, understand at this time frame, there was no such thing as Christians. All right? Jesus was not a Christian. Jesus was a Jew. And he was Christ. And those who followed him, when, when people started making fun of them, they called him, them Christians. They were making fun of them. Oh, those stupid people who believe Christ. That he was the Christ. And so, so when this looks back, I don't want you to be troubled by the fact that when it talks about those that are sealed into heaven are, are the tribes of Israel, because there was no way to discern or converse or talk about those who came after the tribes. Jesus was still out of the tribes. He came out of the tribe of Levi. You know, the, he, he was one of them. And so when we see this, remember 12, 12 is where the earth responds to the divine and thousand, thousand is a great one because thousand means beyond countable. So out of Judah, out of the tribe of Judah, out of his entire people, his lineage, his heritage, all of those who follow God through the blood of Jesus Christ are going to be there and it's going to be beyond countable. All of those of Reuben, all of those of Gad, all of Asher, all of Nephtali, all of Manasseh, all of Simeon, all of Levi, all of, all of Issachar, all of Zebulun, all of Joseph, all of Benjamin. Levi's in there. Benjamin's in there. Their descendants are still walking this earth, and guess what? They're in this room. And those who call upon the Lord, beyond countable, they're going to be there. So is the 144,000 literal? My perspective, no. <laughs> no. And it includes all of those who call on the name of the Lord. And then you finally get to the opening of the seventh, the seventh seal. And it is the precursor to the next part that we're going to look at. So for next week. <laughs> Can I start over? Uh, so, so do some reading next week. And, and as you read this stuff. When you come across something, if it makes you think of anything else that ever happened in the Bible, go look at that because it's designed to. It's designed to make us look back because only by looking back can we be prepared for what is to come. Thank you all so very much. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. God bless. I look to see y'all back here in about 12 minutes. <laughs>